What's up everybody, Rob here. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the epic poems of ancient Greece and Rome. For example, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. As well as the Old Norse sagas, for example, Egil Saga, or the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok and his sons, amongst many different others. But it turns out that there is another center of epic poetry in Europe, this time located in Russia. Known as the Bailina, they feature larger-than-life heroes, known as the Bogotar, and... Without belaboring this introduction any more than it strictly has to be, here's a quick introduction to the Bailena and the Bogotar. And of course, in case you haven't quite realized it yet, I really am terrible at pronouncing foreign names and foreign words. So if you are new to my channel, um, I have limitations and uh, that is one of them. If you're not new to my channel, this should come as a surprise to absolutely no one. Just putting that caveat out there because it's, well, it's what I do. So, okay, introduction over. Let's get down to it. The term bailina is derived from the past tense of the Russian verb meaning to be. So something that happened or that which was, something along those lines. Though nowadays, generally the term is used to describe this particular form of epic folk poetry. Now the term itself probably originated with scholars in the 19th century, but the tales themselves can date back as far as possibly the 10th century. Now many of these tales, or most of these tales, actually center around the court of Vladimir the Great in Kiev, and the heroes, or the Bogotar, that defended the Russian homeland against outside invaders. Though there are many of these tales from later centuries, and take place in later centuries, including the times and court of Ivan Grozny, better known as Ivan the Terrible, or under the time and reign of Peter the Great, and can actually include rebels against the Russian state, including Cossack rebellions in the 17th centuries. There's actually also a Bailina which features the Russian Revolution, and the main hero is none other than Vladimir Lenin himself. I will not comment any further. Now, these were oral tales performed by singers or storytellers as part of an oral tradition in a mostly illiterate society, at least until literacy became more common, causing this practice to die out in the more centralized portions of Russia. But the practice did continue among peasant communities on the fringes of Russian control, for example, in the Urals or in the northern territories near Lake Onega, as well as parts of Siberia and among the Cossacks in the south. Now, during the 19th century, there was a general revival of traditional Slavic culture and traditions, and scholars and folklorists collected these stories from peasants, running them down for the first time. The, the Bailina were then categorized in one of two ways. The first is the older, or mythic tales, which often have more supernatural elements, and there's also the newer tales, which the Bogotar, or the hero, rather than relying on supernatural elements, is just a normal human with less and less supernatural elements added onto it. Now, the tales, in all probability, have their roots in earlier pagan stories, which were then updated into the newly Christianized Russia under Vladimir the Great, who is actually a saint in the Russian Orthodox Church. This, now, this is actually very similar to the King Arthur mythos. For example, you would have earlier pagan tales of, say, a warrior going off on a quest of some kind and then returning to his king or his chieftain. And over time, that was folded into the Arthurian mythos, where that warrior became a knight of the round table, the king or the chieftain that he came back to or that he, you know, he worked for became King Arthur. Very similar idea. The big difference here is that Vladimir the Great, who most of these tales centered around and was, you know, the King Arthur figure uh, sending his warriors on quests. He actually was a historical person. Was King Arthur a real person? That debate has gone on endlessly and I'm not touching that one. But other than that, you know, same basic principle here. So in any case, who were these Bogotar that the Bailina centered around? Well, the word probably comes from the Turkic word bagatur, which means hero. Now, contact between the Slavs and the Turks was common enough for loan words to travel. The nomadic tribes of Turkic peoples and the more settled Slavic populations came into contact with each other. Loan words traveling in such a way is perfectly reasonable of an explanation. Well, in any event, these Bogotar are heroes, very similar to the Knights Errant, like the Knights of the Round Table, who traveled around Russian lands, defeating evil and defending the lands from outside threats, mostly in the form of Tartars, which was the collective name for the very steppe, people, uh, steppe peoples, which would be at odds with Russia for many centuries. Now, the most famous of the Bogotar are the trio of, and I'm going to mispronounce these, I am very sorry, but the famous trio of Alyosha Popovich, Dobryana Nikitic, and Ilya Mormets. That's actually not too bad, but I'm, I'm sure if you're a Russian speaker, I'm very sorry. Anyway, 
Um, interestingly enough, although these characters are probably fictional, they may very well be based on real individuals, which is actually very similar to Norse sagas. Uh, Norse sagas oftentimes have fantastical elements or supernatural, like gods showing up or something like that, but they also feature real people in them, or at least are based on potentially real people. So for example, Dobrynya Nikitic may very well be based on a real person, Dobrynya, the maternal uncle of Vladimir the Great. And Ilya Moromets may very well be based on the venerable Ilya Pechersky, who was a monk that would later be canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church. Now each of these Three of the Bogotar display different traits and abilities that would help them accomplish their missions. Uh, Dobrynya had great physical strength and courage, but was also a skilled negotiator and statesman, as well as being an accomplished musician and chess player. Alyosha, who was the youngest of the group, was best known for his wits and cunning and would constantly outsmart his opponents without actually having to resort to brute physical strength. And the most famous was Ilya Moromets, who was known for his, well, supernatural strength, which was bequeathed to him by the giant Svetogor, who is a Bogotar in his own right. Now, since uh, we're talking about Ilya, the most famous of the Bogotar, might as well go into his origin story, just to give you an idea of what to expect and the themes that are present and basically how things go in these types of stories. And uh, so, yeah, basically, here's just real quick a the origin story of Ilya Moromets. So in any case, Ilya was born as a peasant in Morom, which was a small village in what is now Russia. And this is about 900 miles away from Kiev, which was the main center of power at the time. You know, this is the Kievan Rus. So 900 miles away. Basically, he's in the middle of nowhere. He's also a peasant. He is not a warrior by training. He is not a nobleman or an aristocrat. He has absolutely no connection to the royal family. He is a dirt farming peasant. Actually, he's even less than a dirt farming peasant because he was born a cripple who was unable to walk for the first 33 years of his life. A lot of significance with that age, I'm sure you can guess. And he basically stayed bedridden until he was healed by a pair of traveling pilgrims who entered his village and they healed him. Why did they heal him and how did they heal him? They just did stop asking questions. So, any case, upon being healed, he then leaves his village where he meets up with the aforementioned Svatagor, who is a giant of great physical strength and, well, size. He's a giant. And the two of them travel along the road together when there's a premonition of death. A short while later, there is a coffin found on the side of the road, and it is large enough to fit Svatagor. So Svatagor says, oh, okay, it must be my time to die. I'm very much giving you the Reader's Digest version here. Just There's a lot of its destiny involved. Don't think about it. Just... Just go, just go with it. Svatogor climbs into the coffin, and before he closes the lid, he bequeaths a portion of his strength onto Ilya, which still makes Ilya stronger than any human could possibly be. Why he didn't just give him all of his strength, or, you know, I, I don't know, but okay, fine. Well, let's just go with it. No further explanation is given. And before closing the coffin lid on himself so that he could die, he then urges Ilya to go to Kiev, a city, like I said, 900 miles away, and assist Prince Vladimir and help him, you know, run the kingdom. Basically, like, you know, be a knight errant for Prince Vladimir, in so many words. He then closes the coffin and dies, because, again, reasons. Don't think about it, just, just go with it. So Ilya, without any further prompting, immediately turns and goes to Kiev, because, sure, why not? Anyway, along the way, he comes across Nightingale the Robber, who is a monster who has the features of a bird. He's basically a human, but with bird-like features and can fly. And also who has the ability to whistle, and this whistle can level vast sections of the forest. Basically the guy's like, you know, uh, basically the guy's bas uh, living daisy cutter. He can just like, you know, level trees with a whistle and just blast them apart. And the two of them fight. They encounter each other. They fight. There's a fight scene. And... He then actually manages to subdue Nightingale the robber, who drags Nightingale the robber into the court of Prince Vladimir, where he then begins his career as an agent of the prince. And in some versions of the story, Prince Vladimir is so curious as to this whistle, basically this living daisy cutter, that he has Nightingale the robber actually whistle while in Kiev, because that's a smart thing to do. And as you can imagine, a big chunk of the city is destroyed. And... Eventually, Ilya then drags him to an open field in the middle of nowhere and then cuts off his head because you should have done that about, like, you know, 20 scenes ago. But, hey, whatever. Again, why do all these things happen? Because they just do. There's a big sense of destiny and preordination with it, and the heroes, generally speaking, don't question why things happen. Like, okay, um, 
this coffin is designed for me and I know it's for my death. Okay. Why? Because it just is. Don't think about it. You need to go to Kiev. Okay, sure. I'm going to go to Kiev. You don't think about too much. And that's really a very common theme you see through many of these by Linus. And, um, any case, this is the, basically the origin story of Ilya Moromets. And this is the beginning of his career working for Prince Vladimir and him and the other Bogotar go off on many adventures. Again, like I've said previously, fighting off enemies, uh, for example, the Tartars, usually, but not always fighting off entire armies by themselves. Also going off and fighting various monsters, especially dragons, because, you know, why not? Sure, dragons. And basically just finding treasure and rescuing damsels in distress and basically typical knight errant type stuff. So many of these by Linus tend to focus on heroes from Kiev, which was the center of Russian power at the time. But there was also another source, uh, much smaller, not as well researched or as well known, which was centered in the city state of Novgorod. Now, unlike Kiev and its Bogotar located there, which generally were selfless heroes trying to defend the Russian people. For example, Ilya Moromets, for example, he took on Nightingale the Robber, who was a monster that was preying on innocent people, innocent travelers, and he basically brought him to justice. You can also have them fighting dragons or defeating enemy armies. Uh, basically, they're selflessly trying to defend the Russian people from an outside threat of some kind. Oftentimes, they did so on the behest of the government authorities, usually Prince Vladimir himself. You know, basically, they're trying to uphold truth, justice, and the Kiev and Rus way. However, in Novgorod, the heroes there tend to be less interested in defending people from outside threats, but rather their own personal achievement and glory. So instead of being heroes working with the government, you know, working with official sources, trying to protect the people, they're interested in acquiring riches, uh, or at least some degree of self-aggrandizement. For example, the tale of Vasily Busilev is about a street thug who went around, him and his gang went around Novgorod beating people up, and then he and his gang basically made a bet that they can beat up all the men in Novgorod, which they pretty much almost do, and after he does that, he feels really bad about it, so he goes to Jerusalem to repent, but instead of repenting, he, well, well, he doesn't, and uh, things just pretty much go badly for him from that point on. It's more of a morality tale than an epic story, but, you know, it's that sort of thing. He's not defending the Russian people against the threat. He actually is the threat. He's basically a street thug. Think of it as a DD and d campaign, and this guy and his companions, they're a bunch of mo murder hobos. They just go around and, you know, cause problems for everybody else, and, um, yeah, it's that kind of thing. So... That's more or less the same themes that you see in the Novgorod-based stories. So, again, not quite the same as the Truth, Justice, and Kievan way exemplified by the Kievan heroes. So, that's pretty much it for the video. Just a real qu short, quick one. I am working on something actually much, much larger than this, and I just thought I'd give you a quick video just to, you know, hold you over. Um, still waiting for stuff to come in the mail. You know, it's going to be pretty big, especially by my standards. Any case, uh, please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it and have a glorious day or don't have a glorious day. You're adults. You can have any kind of day you want. See you later.